Yeah, I guess I'm going to call this meeting to order. It is 6.30, around there, on the 28th. This is the meeting of the task force. Uh, so Denny Hall is here, uh, Sarah Mellish is here, and Harrison is here, Richard Smith is here. It's Sue Philbrick, I saw you on Zoom. Here. And I don't know who else. Sandy's sick, as you probably know. I know Sandy's out. Gar, are you on Zoom? He often shows up a few minutes. He may be a little late. I think he leaves his house. At and, uh, <laughs> Michael Pratt, are you there? Okay, well, we'll just go with what we got. Um, first order of business is uh, discussion of overlay districts. I'm going to hold off on. Uh, communications until we get to public comments. I was going to suggest that if we're going through the districts in detail, we might take public com comment while we're discussing one. the districts. Yeah. It seems a little easier. <clears throat> okay, we can do that. I don't know. I support that strongly. Okay. Yeah. Right, let's do that then. Okay, so let's start off with our big district, which is uh, the Pine Street, Newport Park, um, mm -hmm. Elm Street, Powderhouse, North Court area. And uh, so I did, we did get a communication today from Lorraine Yuan, and she was worried about uh, Newport Park because she thought if we got rezoned, it would somehow wipe out the um, affordable units and would be short those units on the SHI. Hi, Gar. Hello. Mrs. Comfy seat for you all. Thank you. Thank you. So, Gar, we're starting off talking about districts. And Good. I'm going to be taking public comment as we go through each one. Great. So, the first one is the Pine Street, you know, the uh, Morse Court Elm Street yeah. area. And I was just pointing out that Lorraine Giovanni has sent a letter today worried about uh, at Newport Park being taken off the SHI as a result of being resolved. And I just want to state that they would not believe that. In fact, there are no, those units have to remain anyway. But by rezoning it, we could allow for additional units, which would help economically stabilize the property and make it much better. Yes. And hopefully allow people to get off of those second floor units as well. Right. Is, so, there, is there any lingering concern that this could endanger its eligibility under UHLC standards? I don't believe so. I think and each um, mass housing authority controls it. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I understand it. So the question is, can they, can it be the last I heard from Emily was that as long as we're not requiring it, uh, we're requiring this part of zoning to be senior housing, mm. ah. we're okay. So we can zone it even if it's deed restricted to being. <clears throat> That's right. And the same with there are some uh, senior restricted units at 21 Pine. And, and again, at 22 and 24. No, 22. I looked up the deeds yeah. and the master condo documents oh, good. for. Um, 20 and 22. Okay, sorry. And there's no restriction in them um, with respect to age or anything. If there's any type of restriction, then it would be the members of the condo association doing that, and that wouldn't control. Okay, but we can we can zone it even if so. So Newport Park will would work, and and the um, 21. Fine, fine. It works good. As long as we don't require that they be restricted in Arizona, that's fine. Okay. And in fact, at Newport Park, my guess is quite the opposite. We were would be opening it up to even market rate housing if it helps the project survive. And so disabled look, already there. There are disabled already there. That's right. Yeah. When you look at the numbers at Newport Park properties, it's really important to making that whole region work. Yes. And. Uh, Emily's comments at the Monday meeting set me back a bit. Uh, she seemed to indicate there was some kind of question and that she wasn't 100%. Well, uh, you know, I haven't gotten legal counsel to apply on this. Okay. Uh, it is a warning flag because that really upsets the apple cart. Sure, of course. Yeah. 
It would mean having to, I think it would mean having to add on additional parcels for that. Street, no. But we can put it on, put some on at the, we could put some on at the Powderhouse mm -hmm. Lane area, like crossing Sawmill Brook and going into Night Circle and right. um, yeah. Fred Street. Yeah, we could. Not preferable, but it's not preferable. But... Right. And you have the whole rest of Pine Street, which is D2. Yeah. So one of the things we're going to get into shortly is um, trying to figure out how we tinker with the lot coverage and setbacks and things to get to the density that we want. Um, I'm concerned that there's no cap on the number of units per lot. Um, if they're using 2,000 per unit. It doesn't work. Can't do that. Well, but you can't, I, can't we put a cap of 15 per acre? I, I think you could do that. I um, think if you look at the model, you, you, you can't get away with caps per parcel. But you do have this control, which she has not put into play, which is the square footage for the first unit and the square footage for second units. And that very finely controls what happens both on small and large parcels and sets the density to anything you want. I've tuned that, that region anywhere from, from 12 to 20. And when you do that, you, you see that the more dense you make it, the more intensely you affect the smaller parcels because you have to make the square footage low. As it is, that region has to be somewhere in the range of 2,500 square feet for the first parcel and under 2,500 for the second. Yeah, there I, are two different zones there, so we could, you probably would do the two part, there'd be at least two parts of that, I would think that would be different if, as you've alluded well, to. Well, I, I was looking at the Pine Street properties. Um, and just I, the Pine Street. Property. I was just looking at the Pine Street because I, I didn't happen to have it in my spreadsheet before. So I was looking at those and there's a few, and I was using 2000 per unit. But what it's and worth, I would say that there's a couple of uh, it's a bigger lots there, right? Which could have 14 or 15 on a half acre. Yeah. And so, if you had a maximum density of 15 per acre, you'd limit those to I suppose that could work. But for what it's worth, I, I, I find that to be like using a hammer on the problem because uh, you know, you set the limit to 15, it doesn't work for the one that went to eight. And it's, whereas if you use the square foot footage, it tunes it right there. But we can worry about that later, I guess. The trouble with setting the cap is that it affects every parcel the same. Yep, and yep. you don't want to affect every parcel the same. You want to affect a one acre parcel slightly differently than you affect the Can't one and a half. We, couldn't we have a cap if it's over a certain square footage? Yes, you can, you can put a cap so that you say that within a parcel, you must have X square feet for the first unit and every additional unit must be an additional number of square feet. But I want to put a cap up. That puts a cap on. That puts a no, cap. No, it on. doesn't. Well, yes, it does because you have ten thousand square feet. The size of the lot would would, would know, therefore if, limit it. If you're going to include a six thousand square foot lot, you need two thousand per unit to make it eligible for multifamily. Yeah. If you use that two thousand per unit on a thirty thousand square foot lot, you get fifteen units. Right. Yes, and, and you I'm saying have to do that. It seems to me that if a, a lot's over a certain size. Well, you can play with it, but I think what you're going to find out is that you don't get the density you need. There is one place where we could definitely do it, which is the LCD. We could just simply say at the LCD, right. we want no more than 103 units. Period. And yeah. we could increase the density at Powder House Lane yes. to help in the other areas. Yeah, and you can do that the, also. The other thing that Chris and I were talking about is not necessarily cap the number of units on a particular, like you say, a half acre parcel where you could put, let's say, 10 units. <clears throat> Instead of having one large 10 unit building, cap the number of units per building. So uh, we had talked about perhaps four units a building so that you're reducing the massing and the size of the building 
I mean, you can still make go through architectural review with a 10 or 12 unit building, but the mass of the building is going to be rather large. It would be like the units that are on the left side going out Pine Tree on the left are those condos that are going up the hill. They're like- the Left side of what? Pine Street, just beyond the uh, gas station. Um, there's condos on Pine Street. Yeah. There's no, pond pine, there's no condos on the hill. There's a yeah, house on the hill. Beyond that, there's a, a series of condos right along the street that are the four, across, 20 and 22. Yeah, I guess that's right. So yeah. those are the, uh, examples of smaller buildings that, that yeah. kind of break up the scale and make it look more. I wonder if you do, um, you know, multiple buildings. First of all, you're creating a, a disincentive to do it, yeah. which isn't all bad. However, can you still meet the setback and parking requirements if you do that because you're eating up you know if you have separate buildings you're all of a sudden you're eating up one so so the model would i believe and this is richard maybe if we if we put that in i mean the model will still show you could build 15 units or 10 units whatever it is but in all reality the builder is probably might only build two four unit buildings because He's got to have separation between the buildings, extra drives, and he's going to have a limit on the, the lot coverage. So you might artificially be pushing that number down realistically a little bit by breaking up the numbers of buildings. Plus, um, you but know, it doesn't I, impact the model. But I don't believe this is yeah. more well, of a question. I hadn't a chance to talk to Richard about. That. I think I think what I would say, rather than to quibble with anybody's suggestion is that I don't see how we come to a good result here without digging into the model and actually putting in numbers. There's nothing in the model that says anything about multiple buildings. Right. So maybe you could get away with that. Maybe you couldn't. It wouldn't be something I could answer. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that unless, unless you sit down with this thing and start putting in real numbers and looking at the results, which it tells you by parcel, mm -hmm. you don't really know what you've got. And I don't know that I have the best solution for it. I don't, I think any of us might come up with a good solution. There's there's a thousand ways you could set the existing parameters here. Well, it's a very complicated whack-a-mole game, isn't it? It's not, like that and that's you know, it's, it, it's I, I wouldn't, it, it's not hugely complicated. There's, there's like six variables that really matter. And then you've got different zones within the same, different overlays within the same area that you can tweak with differently. Yeah. But what my concern is and has been that if we continually wait to go back and forth within us on coming up with this fine tuning, we're going to find ourselves playing a musical chairs game where we take whatever we have when the music stops. Agreed. And I don't think that's going to give us a good result. So Richard, can you, while you're driving around in the next couple of weeks, Will you have time to start fiddling with the model and telling us how what's? Well, I think we need access. To, I, I think, think we, all of you should we be need the spreadsheet. Happy, and I will be happy. So to, we can all get access to it, but maybe you can. Yeah, I'll tell you what I can do. I, I've, I've loaded my version of the model. Now I would prefer that you have Emily's version because then you might have more confidence in it. When she gave it to me, it was locked, so she'd okay. have to be willing to give you an unlocked model. If she won't give you an unlocked model, I'll give you my unlocked. Um, but I expect she will. And I, I can I can certainly give anyone who's interested in doing it some, for what it's worth, whatever I've learned in playing with it. But I, I'll tell you, it's uh, it, it's going to also put you in. A, there's another slight complication to this. So the way that model works is is that the model contains five areas. You set up five areas. You could do more, but it starts to get complicated because their model only does five areas at a time. Mm -hmm. So we already have four. So we could presumably break up the Pine Street into two pieces for purposes of our work. I'm making a kind of preliminary decision that we're going to split that overlay at Powerhouse. I guess. We have more than four. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. And and then what you do is you you set the parameters for each of those five separately, 
it tells you exactly what the density is for each of the individual areas, and it tells you what the overall density is for the total. So, yes, I think absolutely everyone here, this should be a, a, a working task, and we should we should be working to come up with our best solution. And if Emily tells us that it doesn't work, then for some reason that we don't understand, well, then that's fine. But I, I don't think we want to wait for somebody working at Innocent Associates to 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 get to where we want to be. It would be impossible for them to do that. Well, they're not. We don't. We don't they're have doing enough. things, and we don't have enough information as to what you can do in order. But I played with it early on, and there was flexibility in it. Um, and I don't know if their flexibility they're using is what we want. Well, I know uh, what they're doing. Uh, what they're doing is they're not using any square footage limitations on first and second unit. They're not using any caps. What they're doing is plugging in, uh, and, and, and she has done a few other things beyond that. But what she started out with was 40%, 70%, three right. stories, and uh, same setbacks as the general district, and then nothing. But with our situation, we're going to have to do more than that because these these small lots and the tremendous variations we have in the sizes of lots within these areas makes it important for us, I think, to really tune it carefully. And then we have a big decision to make, which is what do we give up in the town versus the LCD? Because mm -hmm. it just preliminarily, if you don't put 150 units up in the LCD, which is 20 per, per uh, acre, you're you're hurting, in my view. Well, I I think that we've talked about a long time about having greater density in Powderhouse Lane. Yeah. Um, I think we need to play with that. You know, I, I think we need the option to play with this stuff and come up with ideas instead of having it all come out of one or two people. You oh, know, I'll mail it to you tonight. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and me too. Yeah, everybody. Mm -hmm. I'll mail it to the uh, email to Gail and she can spread it to all. And uh, what I have right now is four districts, not not five. So, but I think that'll suffice. And as far as we have to have Powderhouse more dense, well, that's going to happen anyway. I mean, by the I, way, I know it is. But the fact of the matter is, we're putting this stuff out there. We're not dealing with any of these details. So if we make Powder House Lane more dense, how how can we down adjust some of the others to make it more reasonable? And and we talk about it, but we haven't modeled it. Well, I think I've been talking about that and modeling that for about the last two months. Well, so have I. And, and we're just we're not getting any place. And I'm and so we'll just really frustrated. It. We'll do it, then we'll tell Emily this is how we want it to be modeled. Yeah, right. I, I think also I should send the model to her. I, I have I want to make sure that there is nothing that I have done that. Uh, yeah, that's good idea. But what, like I said, maybe you should ask her to send an unlocked model to us because sure. uh, I would be happy to see everybody using her unlocked model rather than mine. That just takes a little heat off me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, you really want to bear this whole thing. Okay. Any other thoughts on this? I think we're going so, backwards. Yeah, so I, I get a question. So do we want to, I mean, so as far as the model goes, have we, maybe we should work through a few um, items so that we're all kind of working off the same thing. In other words, for example, setbacks. Are we going to have one setback or are we going to like, defer to the underlying the district because then that changes um, quite a bit. So what I, what I would like to see, I think, is that we use the underlying zone dimensional requirements as much as we can, make as few changes as possible. And I think that will probably, uh, except for Newport Park and for maybe uh, powder house. I think that's probably what we want to see is this, the same basic zoning so arrangement. What I'm what I'm going to send out is the general is plugged in with the general district setbacks. Okay. Okay. General and so and the general district coverage, mm -hmm. forty seventy. 
But do you want us to detail? We don't one? need to use the 70, we just need to use the four. But D1 and D2 are the same as the general district, I think. The yeah, the setbacks same. are the same. Yeah, setbacks and, so and, and lot coverage, lot, is lot coverage the same. and and, and the minimal size. lot size. Is lot size. Well, D2 doesn't have a lot size. D2 is merely an overlay district on top of the existing districts saying that you can build two family, two, right two family structures special by special permit. Right. Okay. So we, there's no lot restrictions on it per se. Okay. And it's the underlying district that controls the lot size. And D1? That has the 6,000 square foot lot. Okay. And D2 That's the Arbello Street area, that area in there. Yeah. D2 is the one that goes on both sides of Pine up to Pleasant. Right. It's, it's on Pleasant, the one side of it's school. The heater. Yeah. One of the things that you'll notice when you work on this model is that there's actually three lot sizes it asks for. One is minimum lot size, right. then the first unit size, and then the additional unit size. Frankly, I don't know what that. I did it without the first, the second and third unit size. I know you I did, just, but that's I where, like that. in my opinion, that's where you tune it. Um, yeah. But I don't know what the first number means. It doesn't really matter. What you'll also see, I guess you would expect to see, um, depending on what you set those first and second lot sizes for, a lot of lots have no multifamily capacity. Right, that's the problem. One of the questions that I have, which I don't know if we've answered, is what, if anything, does MBTA zoning do to a lot which does not qualify for multifamily. Exactly. Does it change the general zoning laws that currently apply? You well, I, you shake your head, but do you really know? I believe that based on when I looked at the model, it's doing the calculation as to what you can fit on the size parcel that's there. Oh, I know how it's doing the calculation. That's not the question. And so if you can't come up with three units, <clears throat> Then it's not multifamily. I understand, but that's not really my question. My question is this: We know that we know that the general district zoning requires that you allows you to convert a single to a two or three family only if you stay within the envelope of the building and only if you provide parking. Right. My question is whether or not putting those properties inside the MBTA zoning alters that restriction, even when that parcel does not specifically allow you to go to three units. I don't think that's obvious. I think that's I fully think, addressed in the text. Of the I think if you can't qualify for a multifamily under the MBTA, the underlying zoning has to take right. I hope that's true. I'm asking that question because I don't know. Does true. it add to our capacity to be able to? It wouldn't include the include certainly doesn't capacity. add to our capacity, but no. but would you be willing to you know bet a thousand dollars on whether or not it alters our underlying zoning? We're putting an overlay on there. I don't know. No, it, it doesn't no. unless. As long as your language is clear that you're not altering the underlying zoning, that if you're utilizing the overlay district requirements, you have to meet those requirements, and it doesn't change the end. Right. So, but for example, if you have a one one space per okay. unit as opposed to one and a half. Well, I don't want to belabor the point, but I want to really, really, really make sure because mm -hmm. this is an important point to me. Because what it would do if it did not allow the existing zoning to work through is what I have long argued is important. And that is it would undermine, it would increase the ease of of of, of taking well, single families you know. to three families when they don't otherwise. So your he, point being Emily that, has said that the underlying zoning is not impacted. Well, of course it's not, but under what circumstances can you do something under the new zoning? Can you only use the new zoning when you happen to have been computed for capacity of three units? I don't know that. The, the, the current, the MBTA zoning doesn't limit the number of units that you can put on a right. parcel. It only means that we we zone to that. I just don't know. So if under- uh, It's the, probably okay. Our under, zoning the existing, under the existing program. zoning, you can convert a uh, single family house to a three family by right. With restrictions. With no. restrictions. I, want to know, I want to make so sure those restrictions, restrictions don't go. Would remain. They would remain. Well, we hope so. I hope so. I, just, I think we've talked about this a lot. Yeah, but no, we haven't talked about this in relationship to the MBTA zoning at all. Well, I think we can simply say in, in the language of the overlay district that that it does not apply to. Okay. I, I, I won't belabor it. I, I just want to make sure that we keep that in mind sure, that we don't allow that to get overlooked. That's reason. Yep. 
What happens to the parking? The parking under the she's assuming zone? one and a half per unit. Is it, that's what it is now. And that's what it we is. have in town today. What is that? Yeah. Yeah, that's part of concern. And and I think that if we were to increase it greater than one and a half per unit for the MBTA overlay district. We could run different. into problems because right. the state would feel it's more restrictive. Right. On the other hand, we might want to, depending on what the model does, you might want to consider saying one space for one single bedroom for yeah. one or two bedrooms. You know, it's, it's a weird thing. And I, don't, I don't know how that would It doesn't work. impact no, the It's model. a weird thing on the model, uh, Sarah. I, I, I found that changing the parking didn't make sense. Right. It, it, they're assuming 300 square, what is it, 300 square foot per parking space and we we have that amount of open space because well, of our coverage right. yeah that's, that's right. right we I, have it. I think it's not right. an issue well, we'll have it, I guess. no I, I plugged in high parking numbers and it what, didn't seem to be whether much. whether the the lot itself because to, topography allows parking is ir irrelevant for the model mm -hmm. Although it's just it a be, strict calc it would be too bad to require a space and a half for newport park if we got bigger well we can have separate requirements for that mm -hmm. Well, Same yeah. as for Prada House Lane, if we allow bigger density, maybe we want. Exactly, that's exactly right. the point. Yeah, or the opposite. If we do the LCD, we may want to require, let's say, two spaces per unit. Perhaps. Perhaps. I mean, just throw it out. Yeah, the parking alone eats up an acre and a half over there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I can't tell if people have the uh, any public comments here. Where can we find out who's... Lorraine Ayabani? Lorraine Ayabani, can you hear me? Um, I, Sandy had her hand raised. Um, and... Oh, okay. Lorraine, you know, this, Sandy's a member of the task force. I'll let her speak first, and I'll come no, to you. No, Sandy isn't. Oh, Sandy okay. Rogers. Sandy Barber-Turner. The Sandy is Sandy Rogers. Go ahead, Lorraine. Um, Sarah and I can go after. Okay. Okay, hey. terrific. Uh, good evening. Fine. Good evening, everyone. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I'm hearing is um, uh, Mr. Smith um, asking for clarification on whether um, underlying zoning uh, will remain in effect. And I want to stress that I absolutely agree with that. And I think that would be a major point in terms of educating and soliciting um, agreement uh, with residents. So um, change is not always a, a good thing, uh, but in some cases, um, if you have um, things that aren't changed as much, it might be something that people might be interested uh, in supporting. So we have to make sure we get a clear answer on that. The other point I want to make here is I'm not sure why Innis is locking the model. I don't know what that means. Um, it sounds like a control of uh, certain algorithms. And you know, the level of frustration that I hear is because it's very hard what you're doing, trying to fit all of this into a very unique seaside town. So uh, yes, by all means, let's get it unlocked and uh, those and you folks, Mr. Smith and company, whoever's, you know, skilled in looking at it, uh, take a look at it because I raised this issue as to um, what the base data is that we're relying on. So I would like to uh, see that unlocked as well. I would like to also just a matter of correcting the record. Um, uh, 20 and 22 uh, Pine Street are in fact uh, deeded. Uh, there's a special amendments to the master deed, which uh, do in fact make these age restricted. It's just simply a matter of correction of the data on the record. Um, other than that, um, that's what I hear so far. And thank you for all your work. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Can I speak to the law? Yes. I was just going to say that um, thank you for your comments. Uh, our understanding now is that the deed restriction has no effect on our ability to put an overlay to count the pro property in an overlay district. I wanted to speak to the lock issue. I, I wasn't implying that Innocent Company was doing anything to restrict our operation. I think 
they were merely protecting the accuracy of a model that they had prepared. Mm -hmm. We do have unlocked models that we got from the state. They're available to us. Uh, I was only mentioning her unlocking hers as a courtesy to us. And so it, it has not been an obstacle. I, I don't want to imply that it was. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, Sandy Rogers. Hi, um, I've got a couple questions. And um, I think uh, one of you mentioned this is we're looking at the lot sizes and we're not looking at topography. So if a lot cannot be built because it has water on it, that is not factored here. We're just looking for density in square footage area. We're not looking at whether it's a viable building lot. Just wanting to be sure. I know there was mention of like, well, if we can't put a driveway in there, then the developer won't develop it, but we can still count it. Um, so I'm just, I have a, that's my first question. I'll sit there and I'll wait and I'll ask my next question. Okay, so the answer to that is, uh, the, part of this, I don't want to call this a game, but it, it's a little bit of a game. We're dealing with a computer model that tells us what land we can zone and what we can't. We cannot zone wetlands or, or open water or um, any Cemeteries. other Cemeteries. Cemeteries, yeah, there are a bunch of things. Municipal Educational land, land we can't. Land. Those are all called uh, excluded land. So if we try, we can include them in a district, but we don't get credit for the acreage or any units that we could theoretically put on them. So we're left with a kind of this funny blank slate where it says now cut it up and zone it the way you think it's going to work. And go ahead and sure. I was just going to say. Um, the the state maps exclude land that is wet or sent, uh, that is underwater, um, but they don't do anything about land that's vertical or um, rocky beyond or a floodplain or a floodplain. Yeah. So um, right. So that, some of those lots on. Um... Pine Street have like a stream behind them and some of the other lots and other areas, as long as they're not deemed they're legitimate still wetlands, you can you can put the density in there, even though they're not reflected on the built. state map. And I want to make this clear also, this does not override the Conservation Commission's uh, right. responsibility and authority over the land. And and the state law is very clear about that, that we're just zoning it, we're not we're not approving development projects. Right. So by Powder House um, near Newport Park, they might have to ratchet in that acreage based on what the Conservation Commission says. Yeah, but you can still leverage whatever acreage once you do the setbacks and everything. Yes. Uh, to no, count one, thing, it. one thing that would happen that the, the land that is that is blood prone or ecologically sensitive is called sensitive land. We can zone it, but if we decided to try to fool the state by by just creating districts and sensitive land, yeah. <laughs> they would they would see that and then say, no, that's not acceptable. So we've got to make a reasonable effort. But yeah. we don't need to decrease our acreage by acreage that the conservation commission has control. That's correct. We can include that. That's right. Right, right. So that's one thing. Um the LCD area, um, I'm not sure if that area is where there's hills, um, both in whatever districts and town and also in the LCD. I heard something earlier that said three stories. We have a certain two story plus whatever eaves or whatever limit. And I think that that's one of the concerns that everyone has in town is one regarding when you add density and you add more height, it, it, that's where it starts to overwhelm what our town is used to. And the same thing, if you're adding chunking up, like, yeah, we put three, four, five stories out in the LCD. Some of that space is very high up. And so 
I think that we have to be very cautious looking at topography ourselves. Um, and even if we allow it in the district because of density, um, are they going to be looking at like, if you're adding the square footage because you're allowing for that height, then you have to change the zoning for that height. And so this Sandy, there's the, just a real concern over the height aspect. Look, the property we're considered right now in LCD is the Cape Ann storage, which is low. And the the height restriction in LCD is currently 55 feet. And it's right. also already developed. So we're not talking about right. zoning, you know, pristine land. And it's right. it's 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 abutted by wetlands. So it's only the currently disturbed part that could be built on. For, okay. for the future in the discussion, we've just we're, we were discussing one area. Yeah, we and, moved and on to other places. We, okay, I just like I was just basically talking about the heights in general, yeah, so okay. just yeah. in topography. So Sandy, but, there is one thing we to keep in mind, which is the higher we can allow buildings to go, the less area we have to impact. This is particularly true of the LCD, especially in the LCD, but right. anywhere in town. I mean, we're trying we're trying to minimize the impact on the downtown, and if that means right. we have to go to three stories in parts of the downtown to get there, that might be a fair trade. And that that would change underlying zoning. Well, it's like um, Powder House Lane is currently three or four stories. Sure, yeah, Powder, but most of these buildings we're talking about, well, Powder House Lane, three stories. There are buildings in the downtown that are three and a half stories. They're, they're not typical, but they're there. So we're not breaking precedent necessarily. And, and it's not changing the underlying zoning. There are two things. There is the underlying, underlying zoning, which will stay at the current height. If the overlay allows more height, then you have to live with the overlay rules if you want more height. Mm -hmm. If you want to do, take advantage of the underlying zoning, then you have to stay with the whole of the underlying zoning. Correct. Right. And that that's, I think, where it was just getting confusing when you were talking about underlying versus overlying zoning. So thank you. OK. Thank, thank you. you for all like you're trying to do. <laughs> OK. Any others? Liz? Or Gail can see the hand. Gail, can, can you tell us if there's anybody else with a hand up? Kathy Pallotta has her hand up and Sarah Pierce has her hand up. And a gentleman had put something in chat. Um, uh, I, um, we, we can't take stuff off the chat. I, but I, I know, but I wanted to say that someone had put something there and he, he may want to ask his question. That's where okay. I was going with that. Okay. I understand that. Uh, Sarah Pierce, we'll, we'll go with you. Please. Hi, thank you. And I continually watching these meetings. I do not envy your job at all. This seems to get complicated as we go along and then somewhat sorted out. But I will stay within the area that we were initially discussing, which is like the Morse Court, Elm Street area. One thing I did notice on a preliminary map that had come out was just that, that there was a section by the powder house and where the bike shop is that is directly abutting water. And so I know you just mentioned that was sensitive land and that would be under the guidance of CONCOM. Um, I don't know if they've weighed in on any of these preliminary maps, but that's there is no buffer zone included there and then secondly just to follow up uh my next question is what would happen if a developer came into morse court and i don't know exact percentages here so don't quote me but there are a lot of awful uh a lot of rental properties that are owned by a certain individual or family what if they decided to, let's say 80%, they decided to sell all of those rental properties to one developer? Would they be able to develop that whole area or would can they marry the lots? Like, how would that work? So they could uh, technically buy all those units and uh, combine them into a single parcel and develop it, yes. 
but they can do that today. They don't, this isn't going to be part of the MBTA overlay district. No, they but I think there would be more incentive with the MBTA, right? Uh, I, I don't know how many units are actually there. Maybe there'd be a slight incentive. Maybe. I think there are a lot of rental units. I just, I just wondered. I mean, I lived on Morse Court for a while, but I know that I would say guests like 80% our owned rental units. And if someone came in, bought them all, and then let's say you raised it to three or four stories, we'll say three, because four is a, a bit much, but yeah. that could add a ton of density in that area. So just wondering. Well, we can, so here's what we're going to do eventually. We're going to look at every one of these parcels. Okay. We want to determine what's on it now, what is currently allowed under the current zoning, what would be allowed under the MBTA zoning and what the probability of that happening would be. So that every single parcel you'd be able to see eventually exactly what the what the likelihood of development is going to be. So if the probability was high, would that be under by right zoning? Yes. And I guess I'm still, I know this sounds kind of foolish at this point to question again what by right zoning is because we've gone over this a lot but maybe it would be helpful just to also add exactly how that would apply to an area like Morse Court and the properties that encompass at least three quarters of that area. So under the under the overlay district rules uh, you could build multifamily housing in a certain density by right subject to site plan review by the planning board. And receiving a building permit and complying with all of the building code in the Massachusetts building code okay. and subject to conservation commission if conservation commission has jurisdiction. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And is there any point where you think you'll get to a place where at least in the village that you would set a height cap? Yes. We will set a height cap. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Let me just address one more time something that you brought up. We can zone for multifamily housing areas that are subject to control by the CONCOM. We don't have to make exclusions for areas that are sensitive. The CONCOM can then come in and say, sorry, you can't build on it, but it does not impact our compliance with the law. Okay, so the state's fine with you submitting plans that include wetlands. Yeah, not wetlands, but buffer areas. Buffer areas, buffer areas certainly. It's, it's an inconsistency in the regulation and one that if we don't take advantage of, I think we'll pay a price. Yeah. Right. Okay, just curious from the map. That's all. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Kathy Bellotta. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Uh, thank you again to the task force for their great work. Um, you've got some really viable options here. I have a question about um, the lower pine um, option, um, specifically where the gas station is. So right now, I, I think I recall, I just wanted to confirm you saying that when you get to the point of looking at design guidelines, you can request that the parking be in the back, uh, you know, not on the street facing um, development right we can, you could, we can not just request it we can require it require it okay good um i when you get to the point of doing those design guidelines and you're looking at the gas station on the corner my question is that that gas station has a lot of curb cuts and it's got a very it's very pedestrian unfriendly <laughs> so i'm wondering as part of your um design guidelines if it's possible to do something about those curb cuts so that if something were to be built there, if a three family or whatever it was built where the gas station is, we could increase the safety, not um, and not let it get worse because of development. I didn't know if that could be included yes. in the highlights. Yes, yes, we could. And yes, that was what we were hoping. Okay. All right. And just to clarify, um, I think Sarah mentioned that um, you didn't mention 21 pine condominiums. We we do not have an age restriction on our deed. So we are, um, uh, any age can can be here. Well, it doesn't really matter because it's not 
you know, it's not going to be affected by our right. zoning change anyway. So thank you. Okay, yep. that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Gail, any more? Not at the moment. Okay, should we move on to another district? Oh, oh, Mary's got a yeah. question. Uh, Mary Foley, I'm um, It's a question. Our current zoning allows for accessory uses up to four board borders per unit. Mm -hmm. um, you can have the home occupation, mm -hmm. nail salon, hairdresser, whatever. Is that still going to be allowed in potentially all of these three units? Um, are you addressing any accessory uses in the new overlay? So I would say that it'd be hard not to allow the, the same accessory uses that any other residential unit in the, in the town has. These are professional uses. No, no, no. She's talking about in, in a residence today, yep. if the owner has a home occupation, right. they are allowed right. to conduct it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it could be a nail salon, it could be, there's whole bunches of things that it can there, be. There are things that it can and can't be. And, right. And there's, a, but certainly if you decided that you were going to do a new computer startup, you could do it. Right, but you couldn't, if you have a three family, yeah. you couldn't, Right under existing zoning, you couldn't rent one of the units right to a third party to conduct a business. Mm -hmm. It has to be the owner. It has yeah, to be yeah. an yeah. yeah. And I suggest that it would be premature for us to speculate on what we're going to do for the multifamily units. There might well be a difference for accessory uses in a high density mm -hmm. apartment building. But the important thing is that as I understand it, no one will be no no current use will be taken away because anybody who is operating under the existing zoning will retain their rights under that zoning. It's only the it's only when you go and and take advantage of the high density MBTA zoning that you fall into a new set of rules. But Otherwise not, the rules aren't changed. Yeah, but I'm not sure we could pass muster if we make it a lot more restrictive than the current zoning. I'm just saying it may not be an issue that we want to take up right now because I couldn't say that a 150 unit apartment building should have the same set of accessory uses that we grant to small dwellings in the downtown district. It's just right. not we're, obvious. To me. But you're talking LCD versus in town. Yeah. We're I mean, talking in town. Well, I don't know what we're talking about, but we're talking about, I know we've got a question about accessory use. Well, it's a, okay. good, point. It's a good point that we can get a leader mm -hmm. on this. Uh, okay. Any more questions, Mary? None that I can see. <laughs> okay. All right, let's move on to the next district. Let's take up Valentine and Summer. That's the one everyone gets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those maps didn't get. All oh, yeah, we didn't get those. Oh, sorry. Oh, geez. There's a problem at the top. There's a problem. Mm -hmm. What are you Does Ann have a fire too? No. No, these are all mine. These? Okay. This is, you only sent around one map? Yeah, I sent around. Sorry for saying some big ones here, but it's Allentine and the. We only received one. It's Valentine, that's what we get, right? No, we're getting another one. <laughs> okay, here's Alan to Lincoln. And uh, for the crowd out there, we'll have these posted on the website. Yes. Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So you can figure out tomorrow what you're going to ask about. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're actually in the handout on the website. Oh, okay. They're in the uh, 125's handout. I've never seen one. Uh, I've, never seen. I've never seen these before. Yeah, so these are they're different. So they're but they're familiar. essentially the same maps. It's the same maps, but what I tried to do was uh, highlight in red the areas that we targeted to include in the district in blue is the other area in order to make it 
five babies. So that because people are asking, why did we draw the district the way we did? So, um, so I tried to kind of highlight some of the development constraints around um, uh, the three downtown districts. So, which area are we on now? Down in my valley somewhere. <laughs> okay. If you don't need it, you can ask me. Um, oh, wait a minute. No, it isn't. It's not oh. extra. Not extra. Oh. So, uh, Mark, would you like to explain this? So, so the Valentine uh, and Summer Development Constraint Map shows the apartments and condos directly across the street from the train Madam station. Ten and uh, twelve summer. Ten and twelve summer, uh, which is a total of between all those buildings, I believe it's forty two units. As the area that we wanted to target uh, for a a. Um, uh, a district. Um, and then uh, in blue is the other area that we needed to do. This is the blue cross hatch. The blue cross hatch. And so the, the between the red cross hatch and the blue cross hatch, that shows the district that we uh, discussed and presented to the planning board. The uh, light green area to the north of that that is our local historic district and um, early on i believe the task force decided that they were not going to include any of the local historic districts and so um, directly across along the train station we have our big commercial district <laughs> that we had also said we did not want to include in the in the zoning district because A, it would be a very high density of units that we did not want to see that many units in the core of the downtown. And um, also we would perhaps one day lose your one grocery store, you might lose the drug store and some other uh, essential businesses that serves the, the community. So uh, that is why that is excluded. And therefore, the blue, it does include the gas station uh, adjacent to it. And then it kind of runs up the hill and wraps around the very beginning of C Street uh, to those old storage properties. And, uh, and, and uh, so that's how we get the five acres. And this is just slightly over five acres, uh, which is our minimum size. And the pink area, I believe, down there is National Register of Historic, a National National Register of Historic Districts. Yes. Which true. is uh, because those, well, actually, the Valentine Movers, I learned, is not really the Valentine Movers. It is the Old Park Green. and Noble Grain Company or Green. something. Yep. Yep. Um, but that, what does that mean What does an National Historic Register mean? It means that someone has registered it on the National Historic Register. Mm -hmm. It means that it has their old buildings. These are all most all 19th century buildings, some uh, as old as 1850. Um, they have no protection. Okay. There's no uh, there's, there's there's potentially some advantages to owners under that, but there is nothing that provides protection. Okay. What's the purple? Oh, that is the National Historic Register. Which one are you looking at? The one that's this one. It's here. No, that's the blue. That's just, no, that's all supposed to be the same color, I think. Okay, the mine blue. looks kind of the same color. Where the, the blue cross hatch does go over some of the National Historic Register oh, properties. Okay. Is that why it ended up being purple? Yeah. Yeah, that's why it's a little darker because okay. the blue made it. But there's blue, nothing there. But you can see the no buildings. Okay. Well, there's uh, I think four buildings, four houses yeah. specifically listed on the National Register. Of no, we're looking at this the section right under the red. It looks kind of purplish. There's no houses in there. It's Summer Street is that return? Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, what, we, what we're looking at is this. That's, that's, the, street. that's the street. That's the street. But it's perfect. This is not historic. Good. <laughs> <laughs> it may be. <laughs> okay, the part that's historic then is. So um, this isn't historic. Yes. That's just. Street. And and the part that's historic and purple street. is the um, former storage this buildings. One house, two houses, and an outbuilding. Three houses. Three houses. Sorry. Three, Three houses in the Valentine Universe. Mm -hmm. AKA okay. Green Silo. George. Any other comments about this? Um, do you know the ages of any of these buildings? I do. I know the ages of all of these. Um, um, that might be well, uh, I can. Well, well, I'll look it up. Okay. Uh, but they're between age and 15 and 15. Okay. I think I think actually the green house maybe nineteen twenty six. Okay, the um, house right next to the railroad tracks I think is newer. Maybe I'll look it up. I mean the little one. The the yeah. protuberance. Yeah, the protuberance is that used to be the gatekeeper's house. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. But oh, it has been renovated recently. I figured it was a it was a railroad it was a railroad utility building, right? Yeah. 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 Well, it was for the. It was for the gatekeeper. You yeah, the gatekeeper. The gates down. That's where he lived. It's a single family residence, and they've just. So I have a working. feeling that one of the, at least one of these houses on C Street is probably on a lot that's smaller than the middle and lot size. Which one are you talking? Certainly the the gatekeeper's house. The gatekeeper is. certainly is, but I think yeah. the next one across the street from okay. mm -hmm. it's a pretty small lot. Yeah. <clears throat> so you know, I guess we'll open it up and see if there are some questions from the public. No hands up. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts from the last question? Okay. No, I think the only thing is, is you know, one of the reasons we wanted to include 10 and 12 summer is because it's pretty well developed. So yeah. the chances of it yeah. having further development is mm -hmm. unlikely. And the, um, the brick apartment building, which may leave something to be desired, has certainly has affordable. Yeah. Housing in it. It's re restricted in that one. Yeah. Okay. Shall we move on to Summer Allen to Lincoln? This is another weird reshaped piece of uh, zoning district. Right? I guess. Okay. So we have uh, two districts in crosshatch in red. Um, the area turned up to the left side of the map is um, condos along, that's Allen Street? Brook. Brook, Brook okay. Condos along Brook Street. Um, and the streets right. And at the, I guess that the next one would be Allen Street going back. We have Allen a- Avenue. Allen Avenue, but yep. Allen Avenue, okay. <laughs> Consider this a language lesson. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually, I'll get it right. So, <laughs> take a few more years. Um, so that there's a large building there that is condo. So that we we wanted to include that because the likelihood of that being developed is is low, as is all those condos. Uh, being redeveloped as well. So we kind of targeted that area, and the other area is um, just headed toward Gloucester is the gas station. And across the street from the gas station are three other buildings that are condo. So that creates the red area there. So um, 
I mean, you say across the street, across Lincoln Street. Sure. Yes, yeah, across Lincoln. Or Manchester yeah. Electric is. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So there are three buildings there. So in order to connect them, uh, we've captured the small lots along Lincoln's, uh, or excuse me, along yeah. Summer Street mm -hmm. to make the connection between the two. And there's two other small parcels um, in order to get close to, to the five acres um, that are within the condos there um, mm -hmm. that have single family homes on them. So we uh, that's how we got to this. The other desirable thing is I turned on the layer that shows the water resource protection districts. And as you can see, the gas station is within um, a zone two. So that would be a desirable use at some point in the future, should they uh, choose to sell, that perhaps it would be developed into housing so that you can um, ensure that there wouldn't be any future contamination to the groundwater. Mm, it's not good to have a gas station in the water resource district. No, it's not really desirable thing. <laughs> there was a, a, there's a building of office rentals at 76 summer, mm -hmm. which was originally a gas station. Oh, okay. So there, there were two. Yeah, yeah there were two. Mm -hmm. Okay, any comments? Any questions from the public? Comments from the public? No hands up. Okay, this leads us to the LCD. Did oh, you talk to I, I guess I have sort of a comment. There's a small section of this. No, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm way down somewhere here. Sorry, I'm lost. Okay. okay, let's go. So the LCD. So again, the LCD, we picked a part of the town that is already developed. And um, I guess sort of remote, but near where the cell signaling facility and the MAC are. Um, it's relatively flat land. Um, well. And it's low, yeah, near wetlands, but not in the wetlands. And uh, we picked it because we thought it would have the least impact on the town if they were here. And it was also one of the smallest parcels uh, that we mm -hmm. could include in the LCD in order to get us to our 37, Ish. 38 acres in mm -hmm. total. So that's right. And, and I think the thing that we, we have to remember is that one of the reasons we're trying to stick close to the 37 is because if we go higher than that, then 50% of it needs to be contiguous. So we've kind of crafted these areas to have the Elm Street area be contiguous. And if we get too big outside of the downtown, then we need a larger contiguous area. Well, any other parcel in the LCD is much bigger, right. therefore, much more full of potential units. A question that has been that I got from someone um, was if cell signaling wants to have housing for its workers, why don't they put it on their own 50 acres? And what I said back was, in order to do that, they would need a zoning change. True. And if it were a zoning change for in the MBTA zoning area, we'd have to take the whole 50 acres and make it suitable for, and that would be a bad thing. Be because cell signaling is a wonderful neighbor, but this is zoning is for hundred for decades and decades and if they were to go out of business and somebody were to have the ability to turn 50 acres into yep. high density housing that would be bad but we could have included 10,000 from the map i would like to 10 raise, acres that was separate i would like to raise a question which i think wasn't answered at the last time so okay. i think should be answered and that is that we made a decision about three weeks ago to switch from 20 acres in the lcd and 15 acres in the downtown to do 25 acres 
uh, 30 acres downtown and seven acres in the city. That was a decision that took me by surprise. And I think it was based upon the notion that there would be voter opposition to a large development in the LCD. That question came up on Monday night and was not really answered. But it's... And I think we should be very clear about what our answer is. I don't know that we all agree on the answer, but I do think it needs to be clearly stated. I, I think it was two pronged. Number one is the large development, but number two is to decrease the number of new additional units. Because well, everything in the LCD would be new, whereas if you're using a larger portion downtown that already has units on it, then your net new number is lower. I, I, I would agree. I'm, I'm Look, you know my position is that I favor the larger development in the LCD, but I understand the argument on both sides. And I think another argument in favor of staying away from the LCD is that one can be fairly, one can be almost certain that the LCD will get developed right. to the extent of the zoning that we provide. Whereas we can hold out some hope that other areas in town will not get developed. Of course, if they do, we'll be some. And, and the other thing I think the advantage of the Calvin properties, the Cape Ann storage, storage is that property is one that CST directly overlooks mm -hmm. and that they might have a vested interest in what goes in there. Um, so, you know, they, they it's possible that if that property went up for sale, they might purchase it so that they could control it. Well, because it's seven acres, I think you're going to find that that's a very dense little part. Right. So whether that fits cell signaling's needs or not, I, I don't know. But that's a seven acre property with three quarters of an acre uh, restricted. So you're going to be looking at 20 units per acre if we, unless we unless we go for a much denser downtown, which I certainly hope we do. Yeah, really what we're, you know, if you strip away all the veneer, what we're trying to do is make it hard to develop areas that we've designated, um, make it expensive to develop, which is the same thing all over again, and putting, as to Sarah's point, creating is incentives for the fewest number of additional units. So, you know, I'm, 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 I see both sides of what you're saying. But I think for a lot of different reasons, we're going to end up in the LCD. And to the extent we can minimize the lot size, which means minimizing the number of new units, that's a good thing for the town. It's the worst, it's the best of a bad situation. And I, and I think if, if you look at all these other sites that we've been considering, none of them are slam dunks to build to develop. You take Powder House as an example. The terrain really isn't going to afford to do much more. Um, if, if you go over there, walk it, right behind it is a huge outcrop. Mm -hmm. Huge. I mean, it's almost vertical. So that's unlikely to get built anytime soon, if ever. And I think what we we are creating disincentives almost across the, across the board for, to, for people to come in and develop the units. Yeah, I, I said at the last meeting that I thought that while I didn't like the 30, the idea of 30 acres downtown, I thought we'd pick the best 30 acres that we could. And I still believe that. I personally just don't favor the trade-off. That's, yeah. that's neither here nor there. But I, I wanted to make sure that I felt like we, we really ought to be addressing in public uh, this issue because it's not it's not obvious. No, no question. Thank you for bringing it up. It's a, it's good to have that discussion. Uh, any comments from the public? Yes, Sandy Rogers has her hand up. I have a question. Is there any 
rules that you have to supply infrastructure to these lots as a town? The answer to that is no. We're under no obligation whatsoever. And right now we don't have water and I don't I, I'm not really sure about the water and sewer going on out to LCD. So uh, my understanding is that the town has applied and gotten a grant to extend 2.5 million 3.5 3.5 million to extend sewer under 128 sewer to, yeah to connect to uh, and and to enlarge the water mains and the sewers going all the way down Forest Street to connect into the connection in the existing culvert under 128. But not, what's the name of the street that goes down into the LCD? Um, Atwater Avenue. Atwater Avenue. They already have water. Okay. Back has town water. I'm assuming we're coming through the back door under 128, I believe. Just... Right, and the water's in that same culvert. Yeah. Okay. So there, I believe they're enlarging the water mains and the sewer pipes. And it's well, going to go all, all the way down forward. The sewer pipes are new. The water yeah. is, I believe, going to be enlarged. And the sewer on forest is going to be enlarged. And mill. Yeah. Um, okay. And if if necessary, all the way down to the wastewater treatment, yep. down to the junction of the mains, the serious mains. Um, okay. But that's so, a service CST and not and not any. That's still being discussed, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for answering that. Second question is: Someone else brought this up, and I'm not aware. Is if the underlying district allows certain use cases, mm -hmm. the LCD being commercial, allowing for things like cannabis and stuff like that. Are there any regulations about multifamilies being next to certain types of properties? Yes, there are. It's part of the bylaws cover governing um, adult entertainment and uh, cannabis that they can't be closer than um, 200 or some odd feet. Yeah, 100 to 200 feet. It's, it's, it's in, when we allowed those things, we put restrictions on, and those restrictions are not, uh, they are part of zoning, aren't they? Yeah, yeah but they don't impact what we can do in the compliance model to, to comply with the this law. Just make, do they make it harder to put a con cannabis shop down there? Yes. Well, and also makes it harder if they put a cannabis shop down there, then it's harder to put in the <laughs> residential because huh. they got more setbacks. I, I never pronounced it that way before in my life. I know why I it. <laughs> okay. Was this a new no, so <laughs> I never heard the word before. Good for you. <laughs> so realistically, you could put multifamily zoning to appease the. 40A there, but because of other zoning, they might be refused because it's too close to that, I guess. I don't know. Up to you guys to figure that out. <laughs> At the moment, there is no cannabis yeah, shop and there's no adult entertainment. So I think that the opposite would happen, if anything. Right. But you don't have to change the underlying nope. spot no. zone around the no. space no. that you might want to have for family. No, the 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 state model isn't that compliance model isn't that sophisticated, which is to okay. our <laughs> Yep. All right. Good. Thank you. Mary. Uh, Mary Fuller, Fuller Street Development Group. Um, tagging on to that, I would just question because if with the marijuana and the adult entertainment if we are squeezing potentially squeezing um where these would be allowed because i think it's 300 to 400 buffers depending if it's a school or a church or housing 
Um, if we're squeezing those into such a small area in the LCD that it seems restrictive, I think we could come into some I, I, legal issues. I don't that. think so because the zoning allows it. And there's nothing that has ever said that you couldn't change your zoning to allow residential in that area. So there, there's, it, it's perfectly valid. My only point is that we developed those bylaws um, to show that we're not um, discriminatory against those. And I, we chose the LCD to keep it out of the downtown area. Mm -hmm. If somebody were to apply and then say, oh, I've only got one spot that I can actually put this, they could claim it's, um, well, but that's for you to decide. And then the LCD does include the Gordon Woods area. Yeah, and I don't know that we zoned it for that part. I know we we might have specified just the developed part of the LCD. The entire LCD that we can check. Yeah. So we did like northerly and southern, you know, whichever. Okay, the, fine. You, you, it's, it's, you think it's exclusively on the east side of, of um, school. It field. could be. Don't quote me on that. Um, we've done that okay. with yeah. the other, you know, I'll with the loud commercial uses that are allowed. There's, so. there's still the medical building. No, there are so, there's lots so, of space. So, so as long as you allow opportunities, doesn't have to be financially feasible, but opportunity to locate a adult entertainment establishment in the zoning district that can change based on whether, let's say, a church was there and all of a sudden it closed, right? Mm -hmm. So now you can have a bigger area or um, a school goes in or now you have to have a buffer around it so the area shrinks. Um, so as long as what's left is still reasonable, it, yeah, as far as size and developability, then that's okay. It may never get developed, it might be the medical building, all that's left. And that's never going to get, it's never going to be profitable to buy that and turn it into an adult entertainment. So it'll never happen. But that's okay. That's legal. Yeah, my only point was that that. There's sufficient mm -hmm. space for it to be. Um, yeah, and I'm trying to find it. I'm um, looking it up. But... I would just like to raise the point, and I don't know yet if the LCD is the best option or not, just um, but um, raising the concerns that if that area were to be rezoned for housing, that may um, help the 40B get through. So if we're saying we're allowing housing on one side and we don't want it on the other, I'm just saying as we're through this process with the 40B, the state might say, um, well, now you've got water and sewer up there. You're allowing housing. So just a, something to think. Um, the, the, they've had the evidentiary public hearing. Um, I believe everything has to be filed. Um, by like April 19th, and then it's going to be before the HAC, and they're probably not going to decide for two years. So I think that anything we change is going to fall in that in between area. Um, that it probably wouldn't impact. That's obviously been one of the concerns, but they it can't review. So whatever they have in front of them is all that they can review. Yes. So so all of the pre-trial pre-trial testimony, everything has been filed. They had the evidentiary public hearing in order to cross-examine witnesses. And now they have to file their briefs by, I think it's April 19th. Um, I think they were only given like 30 days. And then um, then it's sitting with the HAC and no more evidence can be brought in. Okay, well, that's good to know. I mean, obviously if the HAC does not vote in our favor, or either way, it can go into the court system. But I I think that's water over the dam by the time you get to that point, that they're not going to be looking at new zoning changes. Technically. I mean, they're already trying to argue that their, um, their 
single access is not an issue because of the driveway at CST. And the driveway at CST hasn't even been approved and it loops all around the property. Um, but that was brought in. So if, if it were a little earlier, it would make a difference. Well, thank you. <laughs> I can sleep tonight. <laughs> Okay, are we done with these districts? Any more questions, comments? All right, I'd like to move on to the next uh, topic, which is a discussion of design guidelines. We already have them pretty well set up for the downtown districts. The question is, and the architects group that we put together is, would like to would love to be able to work on these for the LCD, if we do a project in the LCD. And the question is, do we have any guidance for them as to what the design guidelines would look like for a project in the LCD? And I'll give you some options to think about. One of them is it could be just one big building. Another is it could be a bunch of clustered townhomes or even triplexes scattered around around the village kind of atmosphere. Or it could be some combination, or it could be a garden style apartment complex, two or three stories high, 20 units per building. <clears throat> so I don't know if any of those are things we don't want to see necessarily, or whether we'd like to see something that kind of mirrors like what we have in the downtown, or whether we'd rather preserve as much open space as possible and make it as dense and as few buildings as possible. I'm gonna suggest that we might want to hold this conversation until the end of April. So till when? End of April. After a town meeting? No, after the briefs are due for the oh. 40B appeal. Okay. Because mm -hmm. that's certainly something they could use. Okay. That's just my opinion. Other people. Until after when? After, after say just it's there. So. It's, you know, I'll mm -hmm. look up the date. Yeah, yeah. I don't have it offhand. Sure. I, for some reason, it, my brain said April sure. 19th. But. We're going to have to hammer that down very quickly then after that, because we'll be having to draft zoning in early May to present to the select board by close to the end of May. I mean, we're gonna have to move rather rapidly in the next, after the next couple of weeks. So whether it's modeling and figuring out the parameters, the LCD design, um, just in order to keep on a schedule to be able to bring it to the select board and hold them, um, you know, uh, Public meetings, I, feedback, etc. So, I didn't think the design needed to be done when the zoning was done. Well, it's going to be part of the zoning package, so the state's going to want to see that, and we're going to want feedback from them as well. I also question whether we really need state reapproval. Well, we don't necessarily need the design guy. I think. Or, yeah, a lot of the stuff. I I, I just think. Emily understands the model. She seems to pretty well know what's going to be allowed and what isn't. We're losing at least 90 days by doing that pre-approval. And I'm not convinced we're going to be ready. That's just, and I just question how important it is. Well, does it have to be part of the package or does it not? What do we know? Well, we don't know. I don't think enough communities have submitted packages yet. To she know. said we could do design standards later, but if you're going to include some of the design pieces in your zoning, then you'd need that those pieces. Even if they're guidelines. No, no uh, if they were mandatory. Well, we, they could be regulations of the planning board that could be, you know, that might be part of it, in which case they could be 
the drafts that could be modified once once the, the bylaw is passed. Yeah, the ideal location would be within the site plan review bylaw that refers to design standards for the LCD or in the overlay district. But know, I thought we didn't MBTA. want everything in the bylaw. I thought we wanted the majority outside of the bylaw. So it the was bylaw would be specific to mm -hmm. the overlay district. That's Which correct. Was, no, but what yes. we talked about was the need for some flexibility. And if you put the standards into you, within your bylaw, then they need to be very black and white. And the design standards being looked at were not that black and white. So they were more guidelines and therefore they would be used as part of the site plan review, but not be incorporated into the bylaw. That was my understanding. Yeah. The uh, approach we took in talking about the guidelines in the subcommittee was that we would give our conclusions to Emily and she would tell us what we could build in, what we could get away with as part of the zoning and what we could not and still meet compliance with the OHLC. And I think if I got the final part of what you were saying, Sarah, that's exactly right. The, 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 there will be some things that we can get into the zoning and that might include some massing uh, uh, and parking orientation. There might be some things we can get in there, but I think we should rely on our consultant's advice in that regard and make them as, you know, take as much of them as we can into mandatory and leave the rest as optional guidelines. Part of the question is what what's our time? Can we can we do this uh, late April, early May? Well, the best understanding I have in my conversation with Emily is that anything that is going to be part of the mandatory had better be included in our application to EUHLC, even for preliminary review, because otherwise we run the risk of finding a surprise afterwards. And, you know, I read an interesting comment in the article that I sent to you, Chris, about uh, uh, from, from somebody at EUHLC, and they said that every single review that they have made so far has been returned with comments for change. Oh, really? Hmm. Now, I don't know how many that is, so I don't know how many people that is, but that would be official. Uh, so I, I think it sort of tells me there may be more sticklers than we would like and would not be wise to alter what we send to them <laughs> after, we after we've we gotten it approved. So that does put pressure on us. It's a good point. And particularly pressure on our LCD standards, which we do not have. And the question that we had, I hope I'm, am I out of? No, no, no. The question that we had amongst the, the architects and the committee in our meeting was, well, what do we do about the LCD? We don't know. It's not our job to decide what the LCD is supposed to look like. Um, we need some guidance from probably planning board as to you know what are your general what 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 general kind of guidance can you give us as about what you want do you want townhomes do you want a community do you want bigger buildings do you want whatever now the truth is that if we have seven acres and we decide that it has to be 150 units i don't know that there's a lot of room to maneuver in that. <laughs> but i do think that we should put as a task force we should put before the planning board a question that goes like this all right tentatively we've decided we're gonna take 7.6 acres in the LCD and it's gonna be, let's say 150 units. And uh, we think that that is gonna look something like this picture and show them a 150 unit building of which we have plenty of examples. And is this okay for us to proceed? At which point we can go to the architects and say, uh, we'd like to do something that was gener general for all of the LCD forever, but let's just get something that works for this seven acre parcel with this density of building so that we can have something in front of us and get something through quickly and get the planning board to sign off on it before we go ahead with it. So 
That's that's a real rush item right now. So uh, one thing I'd like to put on the table is, although we cannot require senior housing, it's certainly a good use for this cut part of town. It might include an assisted living facility. And as long as that's allowed, not required, we should create some kind of design guidelines for that kind of use. You mean an additional guideline, not a guideline that says? <clears throat> Incentives. Not incentive. I don't think we can. I don't think we'd be. Well, it'd be nice to do incentives. I doubt we can do incentives because it's age restriction. No, it's, it's outside of, this is outside of the MBTA law. Yeah, so, that's gonna. You can't limit the use. Right. But we can have incentives to do. We could have incentives to have say, to allow a see, higher building. Sure, we could, we could do that. But I, I think that area is going to need to be dense, and so I don't know whether you really want to have incentives to make it even more dense. Um, you're probably going to have to require, allow the 55 height. Yeah. Just as a matter of fact, the townhouses, I don't think you're going to, I mean, that, that really should be off the table. It really should be what kind of village, what kind of design, what kind of, you know, are, are you okay with kind of because it's out of the way, the standard, you know, four story, let's say 40B type. Two bucks. You know. 15 units to the acre translates to three story garden projects. This is, uh, yes, that's right. And, but this is, if we go to 150 units, we're talking about uh, 20 to 25 units per acre. We weren't talking 150. We were talking 100. Um, back up, back up. We've talked about a lot of things, but one of the things that Richard has said several times is that unless you get that level of density in the LCD, we have to have much denser um, downtown. It's a trade-off. That's not what these numbers are saying. So I think that we're we're jumping to conclusions. Well, it's 100 to 150. Yeah, well, 100, 103 stories, 150s. Now you're talking four stories, elevator building, and well, that works. That works buildings. well for senior. Yeah. Which would be fine for seniors. Yes, yeah, even if it's unrestricted, a four-story elevated building um, allows anybody to stay there. And sure. They'll be required under ADA requirements to have elevators, to have accessible units. There'll be right. a lot of benefits to having a four-story elevated and building, we, even if you don't require it to be age restricted. Well, if it's four we stories, you've got to be elevator. We yeah. don't have a story restriction in the LCD today, do we? No, it's no. just high feet. Five feet, yeah. And at this particular site, because it's so low, it wouldn't be obnoxious. Right. I, well, I, I don't see why we would want to restrict it to three stories there. I, I mean, when you have that number of units, even if it's only 100, the, the taller the building, the less coverage you have, and the more. And you, remember, that's a lot of cars. It's 150 cars, it's a lot of land. Mm -hmm. You've but the the other thing that's interesting about that particular spot is that it's surrounded by protected woodlands. So the argument that we need to leave a lot of green space in there has perhaps a little less weight than it would if it were in the center of the football field. Mm -hmm. That's true. And if you if you did 150 units, you probably have to start thinking about putting parking underneath and putting everything in a pedestal. So now your building costs go from $350,000 a unit to something like $450,000 a unit. I like that. Which means nobody would do it. <laughs> Today, no. Yeah, but that the point is that they will at some point. Right, but, okay, but it, we, we can't require it to be four stories. Well, I just, it, if you, we have if a you, 55. Get, if you try to get that at level of density, yeah, you know, they could do something less, but mm -hmm. if you if they were going to maximize the number of units on that site at 150, I don't think they can do it in a three story configuration. They have to go four stories. So that's an interesting point because you know if you think about it that way, why wouldn't we put 150 units in there? Well, <sighs> when we, you know, it's the it's the jigsaw puzzle. It's not our problem as to how they would have to build it to make 150 units fit. It's their problem. And there is the possibility that it would be cell signaling that would develop it. Right. For their own use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's possible. But I think 150 units 
given some of our zoning parameters on seven acres would be very tight. So I think, you know, that number, if we can push it down toward closer toward a hundred, we can accommodate the four story buildings with parking lots. Well, this is part of the whole equation. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Well, the open we, space that's required. You know, drain, if we have a 55 drainage. foot height limit, why would we want to even talk about stories? We would. We would. Why but change we, it? But we could just cap the number of units in the LCD. Well, we to 103 or something. Yes, but we need to fine tune everything else it's first. Point, so it's not point. worth talking about at this point. Well, because... we know it's roughly around 100 to 125 units. I'm not convinced of that because what we haven't done is we haven't talked about limits we might want to impose on some of the larger lots in the downtown area. We haven't played with that. Well, but that's going to be 20 units or 30 units. I don't. Point. 105 units is, is a density of 15 in the LC. Actually, it's a little less because it's 7.6 acres. So 100 is 14.4, according to her thing. Yeah, okay, 114. So though, at, at 114, you're still having to maintain 15 in the 30 acres you've taken out of downtown. So, I mean, I really do think we need to get down. I, I'm not at all convinced that it's a good idea to lower the density in the LCD at the expense of the 30 acres we've taken out of the downtown. I just don't get it. And I, I don't understand why we would be particularly concerned about the expense that a builder might have to go to to make it work. I'm only doing it, creating, trying to create a disincentive to build. Well, the disincentive to build isn't going to be changed by us allowing more units. He doesn't have to build that many units. If we zone it for 150, he has he can build 100 units there for the same price that he could have built it if we zoned it for 100, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it, yeah. Economically, it's more attractive to have more units. Well, yes, it may not be a straight curve, though, right? So you may, to, to Denny's point, you may you may find 100 is very attractive, 110 isn't, 120 isn't, right. 180 is. I don't know, but it, it's going to be complicated because you're going to have that threshold of an elevator building. But uh, it's again, be an elevator building in any case. If we if we were to zone it for 150, that doesn't disincentivize the building. It doesn't incentivize it either, because they can still come in and build 100 units. Right. If that's if the 100 is a sweet spot, that's what they'll do. And if 150 was the sweet spot, is that a problem for us? Well, it's not a problem for us. No, I mean, it, look, it's we've got all these moving pieces, and I think we need to focus on your point. We don't really want to increase the density downtown if we have to. Where we're having to make the compromise is in the LCD. So, assuming that those are we share those those two uh, components of the puzzle, then. You know, I think we work almost backwards to see what we have to do uh, right. in the LCD. Right. Yes, I think I was a little bit out in front of myself there. I, I agree. We need to we need get back into it. Yeah. Um, I was going to say that I'm looking at the property now because we had an application before the ZBA, mm -hmm. and it is basically fully built up. Mm -hmm. So anything that goes in there won't be disturbing any land. Mm -hmm. There's another, there's another factor, and I guess it's worth mentioning. That particular site um, currently is mini warehouse storage, mm -hmm. which is actually a very profitable business, um, more profitable than apartments. So it's likely, in the near term at least, to remain in its current use. And he's adding a 13,400 square foot storage building. Getting rid of a lot of the trailers. A lot of what? The trailers. Well, he's eliminating 50 trailers. Good for him. And putting in a big storage building instead. Yeah. Good. And plans to do it on the rest of the property. Well, our timing is impeccable then. <laughs> <laughs> and that's probably the right thing for the economy as well, frankly. 
there's a little seniors downsizing and I have to put their stuff somewhere. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we've exhausted this subject, but now I have a couple of ideas to think about over the next okay. couple of weeks. I think the task force has asked the planning board to consider what the planning board would like to see in the LCD. Right. So perhaps we should let's do that. Wait for their wise advice. I, I, I wonder how long we'll have to wait for that. I, and I wonder if it might not be better for us to offer them some alternatives. I do think they have to buy in to whatever we do. Mm -hmm. But we know if we back into these numbers, we're going to have some sense of what we think we have to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And then we can go back and say, we need 100 units or 150 units or whatever. And this is the kind of thing we think we're gonna to have to go for. Is this okay with you? I'm worried about how long it's gonna take. And I don't know yeah, how they would come up with that given. Right. I, I'm, I mean, the I just, dynamics of committees I'm, and I'm meeting saying every no other week. Yes. Well, that segues And you, you missed the piece I said, I'm nervous about us moving forward too quickly on it because of the status of the 40B appeal. You know, there was another question. Everything is due within three weeks, and then it won't matter. Oh, could you explain that? Yeah, so they had the evidentiary hearing, and now they have the final briefs that have to be submitted. And then it's with the HAC, and they can't look at any, bring anything else into their case. They've already brought the CST driveway into their case. Mm -hmm. And if we approve, if we discuss a lot of configuration for residential, one big building versus little stuff, that may give them ammunition. Okay, I understand. So your point is that it, it would not affect the case if we waited three weeks. Right. It, it might still affect attitudes in town. Right. Yeah. Understood. I, that's just, you know. Yes, well, that's a very And I can come up with the, I have to, I didn't have it here. I have the exact date someplace, but. I had just thought this thing was eight months out and it was no chance or a year out or whatever. There was no chance we'd ever know anything. No, there's an April deadline. Got it. We won't know anything, but we'll be past. We won't know anything for two years, but yeah. <laughs> so the next thing we have to do as a group is get into the model and start trying to figure out how what we can do for Density yeah. yes. in the downtown. Yeah. yeah. If there's any wiggle room or it sounds like a plan. I'll I'll send out my version of the plan and then um and we'll ask Emily to then you have Emily to send out hers. Yeah. And uh I'm leaving town for a while on Monday. If in, if there's any way I can help anyone who's having trouble with it, um Email me and we can do a Zoom or whatever, but I think everybody here probably can figure it out. I also think we should ask our consultant to uh, fulfill uh, her responsibilities in this regard and explain to her what we're looking at and that we expect her to provide some of this. Well, I think yeah. Richard Richard pointed out that we're just going in a circle by right. doing that. We we need yeah. to we need to play with it and understand okay. what the impact of various changes are mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. we give it to her and say, okay, this is what we want. Because she's just doing going based on what people are giving her. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying I feel very uninformed because I haven't had the chance recently to go in and play with it to see what the impact is. What do you do if you're a troglodyte and have no ability to do that? <laughs> Expect the rest of the committee to carry. See what happens. Somebody else is going to have to carry the water. I played with it at the beginning, and it wasn't difficult to play with. For you, if I if I figure it out, if you want to come in, we can, can play around with it during the day sometimes. So uh, just this is dumb, another dumb question. What? Based on what Emily has done, uh, what more do you think you're going to get by fiddling around with the model? 
So I want to figure out if there is adjusting density. So instance, uh, Powder House Lane, mm -hmm. can we increase the density there by going to more than two and a half stories? Okay. To, to get more units. And then the, does that enable us to decrease someplace else? Is there any way where some of the larger lots on Pine Street, we could somehow limit the total number of units without having a significant adverse impact on the density. Denny, the, the figures in this model are gonna be what gets written into the zoning. And the changes that you make on this model alter drastically the build out by parcel. You can, you can meet 15 units per acre and have a completely different result with one set of parameters than you do for another. So for example, you can make it 15 units per acre and have uh, incentive to build in a lot of areas uh, and, and relatively lower density in the larger parcels, or you can have very dense parcels and lower the incentive to build in others. So you can make a big change in what the uh, incentives are. You can increase, for example, the number of parcels that can't even hold a multifamily. Um, and when you do that, and you can, and, 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 and at the same time, increasing the number of units that you build in the larger parcels. So what I'm, my point was that at some, at some point, we're going to have reached a conclusion where we have decided what numbers we have in that model. And that's what the zoning is going to be. That's what we're submitting to EOHLC. And that's what the zoning will have to be. So we really want those numbers to favor us. And there's just a lot of latitude. Yeah, and for instance, there's two parcels on Pine Street, which are 5,998 square feet. If you drop it, your minimum parcel down to 5,998, you're picking up six units. Okay. For two feet. Okay. That's interesting. I'm just yeah. nervous that we're not, we're, we're, we are going to run out of time. Well, we'll run out of time if we wait to get a model back from Emily, tell her what we think, and then wait again to get another model back. It's it's just there's just too much. Plus, there's just too much here. And besides, it's not that hard to do. Plus, um, our budget with Emily, as far as modeling goes, is we've kind of blown past it because we've gone back and forth and back and forth multiple times. And so, by us working ourselves within the model even and um and at our next meeting or the meeting after saying discussing the various parameters what we all worked on and coming to some sort of conclusion uh, will go a long way and also mm -hmm. trying to get us you know path it, go you know to to avoid to increase communication and avoid um over meaning of violations. Mm -hmm. Could we feed our individual contributions through you? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, in fairness to Emily, she's got a fifty thousand dollar account. Right. right. You think about how many hours she spent on us on already, and she's got to get us through to completion and not go bankrupt. And, and so she just can't. She just can't spend that much time on us. That's through November. Um. So let's, that's a good segue to the schedule for the next month or so. So let's talk about that a little bit. So a result of the planning board meeting, I'd like to say joint meeting, but it was just the planning board meeting, we'd like to have uh, a chance for the public to comment on all this. So we're proposing a public forum on April 4th. It would be a week from tonight, actually. And just to, just for It'd be like a rotunda kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And we'll publicize it and get as many people interested and say that we're going to be answering questions all night long. And and you know, have variants on, on these to show and introduce. Mm -hmm. Take them up one mm -hmm. at a time. Yes. And and hope we get and we'll have them so that we'll be able to post them on the the yeah. screen so that people at home can see them. Sure, yeah. Because uh, now at least uh, a few of them are done, and I'll add some more. Um, mm -hmm. OK, see. the next thing is April 11th, we're proposing a joint task force meeting with the planning board. That would be two weeks from tonight. 
if needed, another task force meeting on April 18th. Can, can I just go back to April 4th? Yes. The forum? Yeah. What type of time are we planning on that? Seven o'clock. Uh, the 24th is annual town meeting. Uh, there's a slot open on April 25th, which is the next night. I don't know whether that's something we want. Maybe we can put it off and decide if we need another meeting. I just assume not meet right after town meeting, but maybe that maybe is also a um, placeholder for town meeting if it goes past one night. Ooh, okay, well, that's good to know. Thursday would be the, the continuation. I think that's unlikely given the warrant that we have in front of us, but it probably would be inconvenient to have a meeting at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I would be conflicted. <laughs> I would too. Anything out at the town meeting? Yes. Yeah, we're going to update the frequently asked questions and and the map. And the map will well, we'll be a table in front. So you're going to get permission from Alan. Yes. And Good. maps. Yeah, so, maps. And maps. Yeah. yeah. So the 25th is out. Uh, well, let's wait and see. I think this is going to be. And then I think there should be a series of public hearings in April and May just to keep people. Uh -huh. Today with what's happening, so we don't have necessarily a time check. Public hearings. Well, I'm sorry. Public forums. Yeah. Okay. So we had talked about doing one on the 27th, but now 27th of, of Saturday, Saturday, April on Saturday. But I'm wondering whether we want to push that off a week mm -hmm. or so, just because we wouldn't have anything. For the LCD design, yeah, I think um, we should put it off. Yeah, probably a week. Okay, we can remind me when we have. When do we have to hand over our final product to the planning board in time for them to get it with UHLC for a preliminary test? So it's actually select board that does it, which is a question for I guess Ann. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is all going to come together in early June. It sounds like to me. And, Emily uh, said mid July, so I yeah, thought that was. Well, I talked to her. It can't be. Too okay. Long. Okay. It has to. I mean, ideally, we submit to EOHLC on June one. And that gives them more likely the fifteenth. Yeah. But in any case, but, yeah. The question is whether the planning board and the select board can do all, do that with us together, or whether the select board would like to have their own separate shot at this. I think our, our, our charge was to make a recommendation to the planning board. It is. And then they're going to carry the ball. I well, mean, is that right? <laughs> this, is, this is by June 1st, we have not only firm decisions on everything we're doing, but all of the legal language that incorporates it. Ideally, yes. Well, that would mean we'd have to give it, we'd have to have. Uh, is Emily doing the drafting of the yes, language? Yeah. So we would have to give it to Emily mm -hmm. in May, in early May. I don't think early May. I think this is pretty much boilerplate. Yes, yeah, I mean, uh, some of it is, and some of it is. Where we want to put in design regulations. Yes, uh, the we... dimensional requirements that we're coming up with, that, yeah. those are things that have changed, but the basic. Overlay district uses a lot of uses all that. Right. She'll she'll presumably strip out from the design guidelines anything that can go into the requirements, yeah. and that will be part of the submission. And the rest of it, we have more time. Right. I think that's right. Now, I'm still a mountain of work. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. That's why I question: Do we really need to do the pre-submission well, to the state? See where we are in the first of June. Well, I mean, well, I want to go back to this. I, I found if we set deadlines and timing, and even if they slip a little, committees and boards generally meet them. We can make final adjustments later. How we, long you been here? 
<laughs> I know. Well, that's why I'm trying to push. So the June, the June one day, you know. the June one date is if there's a ninety day there's a ninety day processing at EOHLC. So we right. give it to them on June, and we get it back September one. Theoretically, well, they right. pretty much guaranteed ninety days. They say ninety days. They, they say it won't they, be less, and it won't be more. No more, no less. But they're going to get one hundred and fifty of these on June first. Thing you have to think about. Well, maybe they'll toll the whole thing if they can't, you know, act within the ninety days. In other words, push the end of the year, so forth. I don't but, even think they've approved all the ones that had to comply by the end of the year. No, no, that's not. My point is, and I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to figure out why it's June one. Right. Well, because we if never we get it June back, if we get it back September one. Then the planning board will need a couple meetings to make adjustments and then present it to the select board to be placed we'll on the board and hold public hearings in October. So our meeting is typically what first couple of weeks of November before Thanksgiving, right? Yeah. So that's that's gives you two months to get adjustments, submission. Public hearings, and that's still tight. And so. and that's working with something that has been approved by Beacon Hill, which we probably don't want to change. Except that <laughs> probably <laughs> will be, as we've heard earlier, there, that there, comments. there will be comments and 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 uh, things that will need to be adjusted. I, I think it's so. like getting audited. You know, they're going to come. Yeah. Well, they may just be questions and we respond to them and they say, okay. It sounds to me like it's just an enormous amount to get done in April. And luckily you won't be here with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the thing that worries me, I still say, is November comes around, we have the town meeting, somebody gets up at town meeting and said, why didn't somebody tell me about all this zoning that's going on? Why don't we address it a year from now or something like? I mean, it's well, the we have to go overboard to uh, inform, publicize, let people know what's going on here. We, I mean, we somebody handed us a hot potato. We got to do something with it here. We it's not our choice. But, well, that's uh, why we're having these community forums. So oh, we need to finalize right. things so that we can communicate. Well, yes, yes and no. I mean. <laughs> Right now is actually the perfect time to be going out on forums because we have something in semi-form, but we haven't made a final decision. When you go out on a forum in June, you're going to be telling people what you've already done. Right. 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 And that doesn't make people happy. No. Yeah. Makes them even unhappier than they already are. <laughs> I actually have but a question. Legitimate, wait, legitimate. We, have a, we have a hand up. Please. Yes, Andy, yes. So given the noise around all of this initiative, is there another group that is working on the costs of complying, the costs of not complying? Um, because it is not only a choice to say this is the way that you're zoning it, <laughs> which is obviously important, but it's also just approving it in general. So I thought that was part of our contract. Uh, our contract is to explain what's going to happen if we don't comply. It's not to make a recommendation. But it wasn't wasn't part of the contract for RKG to do some type of a financial analysis. Not on not on non-compliance. No, it was not on non It was on what the effect of the density right. yeah. and the build -ups. The, the the biggest problem to me about the compliant about the cost is that it doesn't look like the dollar value is even necessarily the worst thing about non-compliance. We'll know soon when, whether we this won't case, know soon. We won't know so, until November. Well, you don't think they'll so stand against Milton before? No, no, no. They're not hearing it till October. Yeah, they're they're, they're not hearing they're it. Agreed to change. The next track is to hear it in October. Yeah, they That's only right. sit in May and October, and May was too soon. 
did they so the injunction against uh, them blocking any multifamilies is not enforced here? No, no. So, Sandy, uh, let me try to answer your question. Non-compliance is essentially against state law, uh, and there are consequences for that. And the losing the grants is not the not the main part of it, although it's critical as well. It seems to me that unless the legislature repeals the law, which is, I guess, possible, mm -hmm. or if Milton wins the case, which is, I guess, also possible, if neither of those things happen, mm -hmm. the state's going to sue us. And what they're seeking in Milton is not something we want to have happen here. Yeah, and also, Around it's just... Slightly. Sandy, may I just interrupt because yes. I do that? Um, <laughs> suppose, for example, that we have a, ta a town meeting in no early November, and through our hard work, the town votes for this overlay district yeah. by a majority, because it's a sure. majority vote. Yeah. And Milton does prevail. Okay and the law is declared unenforceable. Then we have to get a two thirds vote. So we're to be, but right. my guess is that would be much easier than getting the, the, the simple majority to approve it to begin with. Okay. It, it, yes. it, that, I brought this argument up before because it, it argues for pushing off our town meeting. I know that there's all kinds of factors there, but it's-, it's but There's no reason we couldn't have a town meeting in a special town meeting, a special town meeting in the second week in December. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, we it, given the heat around this, why wouldn't you do that? Because we never do that. Because I don't people think. Go away. I, I, the right. I find it hard to believe that if they hear the case in October, that there will be a decision in sufficient time for us to take action prior to the end of 2024. That's so incredibly irresponsible. Of the justice system in this, <laughs> they're fast tracking it. Remember, those are words. <laughs> so I think that being very clear on on that, but also in the nuances of you were talking earlier about net new units, yes. um, mm -hmm. the net new units, obviously and financially, what that means to the town, to schools, to infrastructure, all that versus other alternatives. Um, I think having that financial view is important. Thank you. If, if you look at the financial costs, the, you mentioned infrastructure. Um, the last time we reviewed our water, freshwater system, aside from PFAs, it's in good shape. They found a way to save 10% of the water by changing the way the wastewater treatment plant cleans its filters. It's 10% of the total treated water. Um, so I think the water is okay. That 10% also comes out of the wastewater. Our restrictions on wastewater are um, the amount that we can discharge into the ocean. So if we use recycled wastewater to clean the filters, we're reducing the amount that actually goes out by 10%. So that gives our wastewater a certain, aside from the fact that it's in a position to drown. Um, that's in pretty good shape. Um, fire- It's under, under capacity. Our, I'm, 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 I'm getting it. All right. I'm just building up okay. a big <laughs> you just blew it. Okay. <laughs> um, the, our, our, Fire and police coverage is very substantially higher than comparable communities. So we're already spending um, more than um, Hamilton, Wenham. Let's not talk about Essex. Um, and that leaves the schools. And our schools are currently 200 students in the high school, I think. I don't I don't have the numbers the, in my the, the The studies when they did the middle high school and memorial school was assuming 1600 students and we have 1200. Yeah, so we're 400 students under um, capacity. The, the capacity of the schools. Certainly- You have to add teachers. But you have to add teachers and you have to 
but um and we're talking potential development over a long long period of time yep. it's not as if all of these things are going to and there's come out. 176 other communities the majority of which are probably going to be uh, better, going to incentivize the developers more than little Manchester with its little expensive things. Go build the 2,700 units and- One building, seven. Right. <laughs> um, the, the area that's confusing is figuring, to me, is, is figuring out how many new students we get and that depends on what gets built. Um, and in the calculation that was done for by our um, finance committee for the uh, 40B project, it was pretty heavy on the number of new students compared with what SLV had. Well, yeah. I mean, obviously, SLV has an entity. Great incentive not to have not to assume the students, but somewhere between the two, there's maybe a reality, and perhaps it would make sense to have someone who actually does that sort of analysis do the analysis for the school population. That's the one part of the infrastructure that I think we can we could we could make we could benefit from outside advice. Well, to some extent, it's dependent on the unit mix. Right. Yeah. Which we can't forget. And these have to be, quote unquote, family friendly units. Yeah, but they only have to be a thousand square feet. Right. How big a family do you fit in there? A very small family. <laughs> I have a lot of smaller units, and I have zero students. And what do you mean by smaller units? What type of size? Oh, these, these are small, six or 800 square feet. Right. Okay. Which is, which is a very acceptable. Uh, yeah. unit size for a single person or a couple, yep. frankly, in today's reality. You, you couldn't get away with doing that on by limiting the square footage to that extent. No, no, I'm not suggesting we do, but I'm just saying that um, that's a very have that's a very marketable size today. Direct direct impact on the on the projections for the school. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well uh, I mean I think the more important thing here is that if we don't go along with this, unless the state changes somehow by repeal or court action, we're we're not able to not do it because they'll come in and zone it for us. And right. I think we'd rather have control of those in the state. You know, I think we should also be honest with ourselves and with people in the town, and that is that we cannot afford to spend a tremendous amount of time in the next two months worrying about whether or not we comply with this law or not. We've got to come up with a solution. And then we can maybe spend a little more time worrying about informing ourselves and everyone else about mm -hmm. what the consequences are. But right now, we got to get a plan together. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and the idea is we put together the very best plan we can. And then we and the town can look at it and say, is that plan worse Right. Then right. the alternative. We don't even, you know, until until the plan is finally done, I, I mean you almost can't even make that argument. We can you can make the argument, but let's get the plan done. That's the right. right. so, so when they did the estimate, when the finance committee did the report for the estimate for the 40B project, mm -hmm. um they estimated there could be 50 new students. 50? 50, 50, 50. 50. The, this is the finance committee or Okay. Finance. Okay. I'm looking at the report. 50, 50 new students. Okay. All right. Which is uh, Manchester has lost over eighty, uh, lost eighty two students between two thousand twenty one and two thousand twenty three. How, how could they have possibly done that analysis when they didn't even know how many new units we were adding? No, no, no. This no, is for the forty B. Oh, I'm sorry, but the forty B, which was one hundred and thirty six, and they took the the you know, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms, oh, okay. and the number, you know, number of bedrooms, and they came up with an estimated 50 new students. Okay. So that's good information. I'm sorry. I Based was on the well, current percentage of students for the number of people. So for every 100 
35 units and recreate new units here, we can expect 50. No, but what I'm saying is, is the 50 new is is less than what we've lost in students in three years. Mm -hmm. But you keep in mind that that study was done at the behest of the developer. No, no this, this is the was... finance committee oh. response to what so, the okay. developer submitted. The developer funds giving twenty students. Okay. <laughs> the, um, was the finance committee's analysis based on the type of unit or just yes. on the average number right. of? No, it was based on the the submission for the four. It was it was actually based on the one hundred and fifty seven dwelling units, mm -hmm. um, and it was based on the number of one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedrooms that were in the project. So the project actually specified the number of each number of units. Mm -hmm. It looked at which were market rate and which were affordable total number of bedrooms. Mm -hmm. Is this 40B or MBTA now? I'm confused. 40B. Sarah is quite correctly defending the Finance Committee's analysis from my mm -hmm. incorrect attack. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mary, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Mary. Can I just make a, um, a comment recommendation? Other communities on their GIS mapping have added a tab under the planning bullet that shows the proposed overlay district so residents can go in and see what properties they can mm -hmm. map out the own acreage, all that kind of stuff. I don't know who does our GIS. The assessor's office, and they have not ever used the overlay But there's a the consultant, tab. There's the consultant and, that oversees it. Doesn't yeah, it? but they yeah. haven't ever put in the D2 as an overlay. That's not reflected in the in the. Uh, well, if you do the zoning, yeah, it shows. But anyway, it's just other it's communities have done it, and it's, it's a good. Idea. Why do we see if we can get that done? Do we, do we know what community was? Is the an example of this? I can email you. I don't have it with me, but I can. Email well, I think it's easy to put another layer on top of them. I'm pretty sure that. Concord is one of them. Last I heard is that for the assessor to do that, the ZBA had to give them the parcel numbers. I'm not sure why the ZBA well, we should have to do that. You know, if I could put it on my GIS, I would think they could probably put it. On. <laughs> well, let's find out. We'll find out. Really, right? until we'll now, out. we haven't had we haven't had districts and a, a, a solid agreement on the overlay right. districts. Right. That's that really has happened tonight. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. So maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I mean, we <laughs> yes, that's true. We may we may change. We it. might tweak it. Yes, of course. We're, we're getting pretty close. So. I'll, I'll put up these maps I passed out tonight in, in a basic outline map so people can pull those up on off of our NBTA website. And um, and then they can see exactly which parcels are, are included or not. So as the districts stand today. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've been take, trying to take a nap all night. Can we just adjourn this thing? Well, uh, but it's your up to you to move. <laughs> I move we adjourn. <laughs> I, I have, and I, 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 sorry, but I, I would like to ask what we do. What, where do we go with these design guidelines? We're, we're, we've got a month left. We've got to put <clears throat> something together for, for, for the LCG. I don't see how that's going to happen. I, th I think I know how to do it. And we don't have to. You have a secret plan. We have a secret plan. Good. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to go back to those architects since you won't be here. And I'm going to tell them here's the deal we got between 100 and 150 units on this seven acre parcel. Tell us what it's going to look like. Okay, that's good. That's what I think you should do. Good. And then, then we have to put something in front of the planning board and get them to bless it. Then we have to tell the architects to go off and give us some direction. Sure. Well, that's got to happen really fast yeah. because uh, it, we don't. It just sounds like April is it. Well, we got what happened April today? and early May yeah, to refine yeah. it. You still need to get more public comments. You've got to have, you know, if you're going to submit it in June, 
when are you going to have to give the language? When are you going to have to give the final results to Emily to put it into language? I mean, you, is it a week, two weeks, three weeks? It's not a week. I bet she can do it a week. She I hasn't do done it. anything else in a week. Okay. All right. Special knowledge. <laughs> I move to adjourn. Second. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> this was good. You may have this all down cold. Uh, and the mother I, told me I have four not looked ago. Are you sure? Don't have that. But that she called me. She must. We can still hear you. I think that did it.